Um, so um, I, I actually, I'm talking about probably the most difficult thing about aortic dissections. We have the easy part of surgeons. We already have the patient diagnosed and presented to us. We just have to fix the plumbing. And um, in, in a lot of ways, that's the easiest. The hardest thing is to make the diagnosis. And uh, being a good Canadian, I have to go back to King George II, um, who died of a um, aortic aneurysm. And the description is, is pretty interesting. The pericardium was found distended with a quantity of coagulated blood. Uh, the heart was compressed, prevented any blood from entering the veins. Um, the ventricles were absolutely void of blood. And then trunk of aorta, there was a transverse fissure. And then there was um, an elevated ecchymosis. So that's the same thing that we see uh, pretty much you know, whenever we have a dissection patient. Uh, this is a lady who I, I'd operated on. Uh, she's an interesting story. She's 78. She was eating breakfast at her diner. Uh, which she did every week, and then she slumped over. Nobody actually noticed, and then when they went to uh, pay, um, she didn't stand up, and so then somebody realized that she needed CPR. And so this is the waitress here. Um, yeah, so this is the waitress who resuscitated her. Um, EMS came three minutes later, her heart rate was 40, she had no pulse. Uh, she got intubated and then brought to um, Edmonds where they did a CT scan and found that she had an aortic dissection. Um, she, she passed out, she had a syncopal episode um, because of these findings here. Uh, number one. So here we're seeing, um, there's actually blood, so they, the aorta had ruptured as well. We're seeing, um, uh, so both blood and pericardium, and she's also uh, dissected into her carotid arteries. Here's the left and the right is almost completely occluded. And then here's the blood inside the pericardium. So you can see how this is bright here. The left atrium is there. Uh, aorta over here with the dissection. And then there's blood tracking along the coronary arteries and then free blood in the pericardial space. So that's why she um, uh, had the syncopal episode. So the clinical presentation is not unlike King George II, not unlike this patient. 40% uh, of patients die immediately, and that's because there's free rupture into a, a space or shearing off of the coronary arteries. So that's either the pleural space, the pericardial space, compressing the heart, not allowing it to fill, and then it can't pump. Or patients can go into hemodynamic shock. Um, this is because of loss of blood into the periaortic peri tissues, and a large number of patients have acute aortic insufficiency. Um, so here in this picture, you can see that there's the, the dissection here, the faults. Uh, lumen and then the flap and then this creates aortic insufficiency because the aortic valve is no longer supported and like Sam showed earlier the right coronary artery for example can be involved in the dissection and then the the artery can be blocked off so that can be the presentation um, as I said as surgeons we have the easy job the emergency physicians have a very difficult job because they see patients with chest pain all the time and they have to pick out very accurately which one has a PE which one has um, costochondritis, who has an MI, and then which ones have the serious um, aortic dissections and other aortic pathologies. 65% um, of patients present with chest pain. Um, other patients present with pain, but really not clear where it is, and 8% have no pain at all. Uh, many have disturbed consciousness, sometimes syncope. Uh, they can be sh uh, with shock or with hypertension. And the presentation can come with complications, and that's really, again, the same picture of the aorta that we've seen multiple times today. Uh, if there's rupture, you get tamponade, aortic valve uh, insufficiency. Uh, there can be occlusion of peripheral arteries, uh, congestive heart failure from occlusion of the coronary arteries, uh, hemiplegia, uh, renal ischemia in some cases, visceral ischemia in, in a few cases as well, leading to pain or abdominal pain, and then paraplegia as well. Uh, the pain is uh, really important to get an idea of what the characteristics of the pain are. Um, if it's a type A, most patients say that it's in the back, the chest or the back, or sometimes the abdomen. It's the worst ever, um, and it radiates into the extremities of the back or the abdomen, whereas type B um, is more likely the back or the abdomen. And if there's absence of pain, it doesn't mean that they don't have a dissection. It's just that um, it's less likely that they do um, when there's a patient sitting in front of you. Uh, the history is, is very important, just like we learned in medical school. Uh, we have to look at what the past medical history is, hypertension, previous cardiac surgery, various connective tissue disorders, pregnancy, vasculitis. Um, it's important to know if they're on anticoagulants. It's important to know the family history and the social history. So 
We've seen patients with dissections from all of these things here at Swedish already. Uh, physical examination, again, is going to be, you have to think of the aorta and the physical exam findings are going to be based on where the pathology is, what vessels are occluded, what, are, what arteries have been sheared off, uh, what's happening in the pericardial space. Um, lab values are all important. Um, uh, it's important to look, uh, uh, CBC is good because then you can have a, 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 some um, idea if there's blood loss. Um, creatinine is important because that can help us identify renal failure. Lactate and blood gases are also important. Um, there's some discussion of whether a D-dimer is useful or not. This is a breakdown product of cross-linked fibrin from the fibrin lysis product uh, or process. If it's really, really, really high, like over 5,000, that's almost um, for sure going to be an aortic dissection. If it's not really, really high, it's really hard to know what to make of it. It could be any number of other things, and there's some controversy as to what the lower limit is to, to help make a diagnosis of aortic dissection. Um, if it's zero, you still could have an aortic dissection. It doesn't rule it out, but if it's really high, it could help make the diagnosis, and this is most useful in the first hour. There's other biomarkers that uh, are being investigated. They're interesting from a scientific point of view, but they're not clinically useful yet. Uh, the EKG may be useful. Um, again, if you have a patient that you know has a dissection, then this can help tell us if there is coronary ischemia. If, the, if you don't know if the patient has an EKG um, and it's normal, that's not helpful. If you don't know if the patient has a dissection, but they have EKG changes, that obviously could be a MI, which is probably the most common. But everybody with an abnormal EKG in the back of your mind should always be, is this an aortic dissection? Uh, a chest x-ray, everybody with chest pain or just about everybody that comes to the emergency department gets a chest x-ray. There's a number of findings. The most common one um, that is always talked about is a widened mediastinum. 62% of patients have that. This is a patient with a wide mediastinum. There can also be an abnormal cardiac contour. So looking at the, the you know, basically where the pericardium would be if it's full and then some other things, tracheal displacement, uh, pleural effusions obviously can happen. But in um, you know, roughly one out of 10 to one out of 20 patients, the chest x-ray can be perfectly normal. Uh, this is why I always say that we have the easy job. Um, so other things, you know, we're very fortunate here, we have great imaging, but sometimes patients could go to a smaller hospital in the periphery where they don't have CT scans potentially. Um, they may have ultrasound, so they could do a transthoracic echo um, <coughs> It's easily available. Um, it can detect flaps, but uh, a transthoracic echo is um, difficult because sometimes there's poor echo windows. Somebody could be obese. They could have COPD where the lungs get in the way. Uh, the intercostal spaces could be very narrow, so you just can't get around the ribs. Um, if you see a flap, it's useful. If you don't see a flap, then you still need to make further investigations. A trans uh, transesophageal echo, and I spelled it the American way, um, has a very high sensitivity and high specificity um, if there's a flap, but there are some blind spots in the distally sending aorta, and uh, doing so, doing an echo if there's not adequate sedation can drive the blood pressure higher, and that can be a problem. Uh, CT scan uh, in today's world is the, the best test to find an aortic dissection. It gives us a lot of excellent information. It gives us the information very quickly and it can help guide how we're going to do the operation. It tells us where we can cannulate, uh, what the extent of the operation needs to be, and, and helps plan the operation so that we can talk, talk and communicate to the team and tell them what our plan is for the operation. Um, it can also uh, tell us if there's intramural uh, hematoma, hemorrhage, calcifications that we need to watch out for, help assess if there's rupture with pericardial effusions, if it's not a uh, dissection, then it can also help us understand what other problems it is. Um, there can be some motion artifact, and we heard about the value of e, um, ECG gating today. Um, we often get uh, questions about, well, this patient has some, you know, an elevated creatinine, and I don't, I don't really want to do a, um, a CT scan. Can I do something else? And if we're trying to rule out a life-threatening problem, a, a, a dissection that needs an urgent surgical intervention, we just have to accept the fact that the kidneys might be injured by the scan, but we're going to save the life of the patient. And ultimately, that we can deal with the kidneys later. Uh, MRI um, is sort of reported to be the leading technique for diagnosis. It has almost perfect sensitivity and specificity. Um, it gives us lots of quantitative and qualitative information. Uh, 
which is interesting, but the problem is, is it takes a long time to do and you're not gonna send an unstable patient to an MRI for a 45 minute or an hour scan. So although it is fantastic for diagnosis, it, it doesn't have a lot of clinical relevance, except for, at least not acutely, but in the long term, assessing um, stability of, of the aorta over a period of years, it can be helpful. Um, aortography has, at least when I was a resident, was still sort of considered the gold standard. Uh, it was on its way out. It's no longer really relevant. Um, some people ask about intra, uh, intravascular ultrasound. It can be helpful when you're doing endographs, but as a diagnostic procedure these days, it does not have any real role. Now, it's really important to make a rapid diagnosis of a dissection because patients can die of this very quickly. We've seen this happen from time to time. Uh, conventionally, we, we quote that there's a one to 2% chance of dying after you have a dissection every, with every hour that goes by. So if six hours um, goes by, that could be up to a 12% chance of dying in that first 12 hours. And this can be from fault channel rupture or end organ uh, ischemia. Uh, this here uh, is basically a slide. Uh, we, we have to have some, uh, or some graphs, you know, with any uh, presentation by math guy. Um, so this is the mortality for a type A dissection that's treated medically. So you can see within the first day, if we don't do anything, it's almost a 20% mortality. And after a month, it's, about a, it's over 50% mortality. Whereas if we operate, the mortality is distinctly reduced. Um, so how do we manage these patients before they get to the operating room? We have to have a little bit of calculus here as well. Um, so what's important is impulse. And this is the change in pressure over the change in time. And so when the heart contracts, it starts generating pressure, the aortic valve opens, and blood is ejected out. And that, that ejection happens with a huge amount of energy, and that energy can cause the dissection to propagate. So what the goal is, is to reduce the speed of which that pressure is generated. That reduces the shear stress and the wall stress, and it reduces the risk of propagation. So what we need to do is reduce um, the contractility, and we do that by um, uh, medical management. Um, so uh, it's important to consider what we're doing to reduce the, the, uh, the blood pressure and the contractility. So um, if we look here, th this curve B is if you think of the normal contractility of the heart and the normal pressure generation that occurs with contraction. If we treat the patient with beta blockade, which is the preferred treatment, we decrease the, the slope of this angle here. And that means that we are having less contractility and a gentler ejection of blood into that dissected aorta, less shear stress, and less chance of having propagation of the dissection, and less chance of dying. Um, if we treat the patient first with a vasodilator, uh, which is what sometimes happens, if you just think, boy, this patient has a blood pressure of 180, and they have a dissection, we want to reduce it, they get nitroglycerin or nitroprusside, that actually uh, reduces afterload and the shear stress goes up because the blood is ejected faster and that can cause propagation of the dissection. So if we reduce the impulse, you can see down here, this is millimeters of propagation of the dissection with 100 beats of, um, or with 100 uh, heartbeats. You can see we can reduce the risk of propagation to almost zero with appropriate therapy. That therapy to start out with is either a beta blocker like Esmolol or Levetalol. Um, once you have reduced the, the heart rate adequately, if the blood pressure still hasn't come down, then we can treat with additional um, blood pressure lowering agents. Um, often we want to target a blood pressure around 60 to 70 and a blood pressure sort of 100 to 120. But we also want to have a blood pressure that's maintaining end organ perfusion. Um, if you have a patient that has shock, we really don't have much data that guides the therapy. So, um, what we think is that we should uh, give IV fluids and vasopressors. We want to avoid inotropic agents because that will increase contractility and increase the speed with which the blood is ejected and then can propagate a dissection. Um, some people talk about doing pericardial synthesis if there is um, pericardial tamponade. Now, that's a little bit controversial in the literature. These are small studies, meaning 10 patients. And one study said it helps, another said it doesn't. It should probably not be done, that's just wasting time. Um, this is, uh, I, I like to water ski, I also like to snow ski. Um, we have to be really careful of atypical presentations. Um, 
like I said, as, as surgeons, we have basically the patient presented to us. We already know what the diagnosis is. But for the emergency physician, it's really hard to figure out if the patient has chest pain from, you know, they'll see probably 1,000 patients with chest pain, and maybe one of them would have a dissection. And some of the patients have atypical presentations. So we have to have a really strong index of suspicion so that we can avoid um, being caught in, the, in, in sending somebody home that has a dissection. Uh, this is John Ritter. I'm sure we're, we all know John Ritter. And he was misdiagnosed with an aortic dissection. They he came in with some EKG changes. They thought he had coronary ischemia. He was treated for such. But he ended up um, having a dissection that was found several days later. He underwent surgery, but he passed away. Um, so how do we avoid uh, misdiagnoses? Well, you, you know that you can be a little bit um, at risk of a misdiagnosis if the patient has no chest pain, if the blood pressure is normal, if there's normal chest x-ray findings, if the D-dimer is negative. Um, young patients will often get missed because who thinks that a young patient is going to have such a terrible pathology? But we do see young patients. We've seen people in their 20s with dissections that we have to take to the operating room. Um, the history is important. Um, <laughs> Um, are the drug users, you know, cocaine users can get um, uh, dissections. Elderly people, there's lots of reasons why they can have syncope or shortness of breath. So these are various pitfalls that we can run into. Uh, coronary syndromes, um, they can get anticoagulator or thrombolyze that can really complicate the therapy. Same thing if they have hemiparesis. It's easy to think it's just a routine stroke. Let's get them thrombolyzed to, get, to make their stroke symptoms better. Um, if you have a negative PE study, um, the contrast may not adequately be filling the, the um, aorta, so you might not be able to see that there's a dissection there. Um, so in conclusion, it's really important if a patient comes into the emergency department that you just have this sort of um, gestalt from your experience. Something's not quite right. You have to have this question in your head, is it a dissection that will guide you to getting a CT scan? Um, and again, it's really important to think about this mortality in that first couple of hours to have a very rapid um, diagnosis and make sure we have good anti-impulse therapy and then urgent surgical intervention. Uh, you can call us anytime, 206-328 Aorta. We'll pick up our phone, we'll transfer the patient over, and we'll take care of the patient. But please, we need the images. So anyone who's sending, Literally tape the CD to the patient's chest because we can't help the patient if we don't know what's going on and, and it, can it can delay the diagnosis if we have to look for CT scans or if we have to repeat the CT scan. So as a final message, um, we always request the referring physicians, please literally tape it on and that will help save time. So thank you very much. <laughs>